Hello everyone, welcome back. Till now we have seen quite a few numerical problems on direct memory mapping, starting from the basics to the advanced ones. Well, to be really honest, all of them are pretty much basic actually. The clearer the concepts, the easier they seem. Anyway, today we will get to know about how direct memory mapping is implemented at hardware level. And this session will conclude with a discussion involving the limitations of direct memory mapping. So, let's get to learning. In the last numerical problem that we solved using the starting address of the array, we figured out the line number where the corresponding block was going to be located inside the cache, especially in the direct memory mapping with the generated physical address the processor can go directly to the corresponding line number of cache. Now we already know about the tag directory, don't we? It contains as many entries as the line numbers in the cache. And the most important part of every entry is the tag bits. Now why am I using the term most, not only, because we have already seen that some of the times, few extra bits are also stored in the tag directory, which helps in efficient computation. So in other words, with each cache line, there are tag bits, of course specified by the processor itself, associated to it. Generally, the generated PA bits tag portion is matched with the tag bits associated to the cache line in that particular instance. If they're equal, it's a hit. If not, it's a miss. An illustration will help us understand the concept lucidly. Suppose this is the generated physical address bits, it's got 6 bits. The first two are the tag bits and these are the line number bits. Therefore, the cache has 2 square, that is 4 lines. And the least significant 2 bits are block offset. Consider this as an arbitrary situation. Now the tag bits are associated with every cache line. Generally, these are kept inside the tag directory, but for the sake of simplicity, let's assume they are placed here only. So the memory block present inside the cache line has kept its tag bits here. Now the PA split is specific to each organization, and once the organization is realized, it's followed as a law within the system. So our goal is to compare the generated PA's tag bits with the tags with the cache lines. In order to do so, we need two different types of combinational circuits, the comparator and the multiplexer. The line number bits will work as select lines for the multiplexers and all the tag bits of the same bit place will be given to the corresponding multiplexers as input. Number of multiplexer needed? will be determined based on the number of tag bits and the type of the multiplexer that is whether to use 2 to 1 or 4 to 1 or any other type will be determined based on the number of lines in the cache. Now the output of the multiplexers is fed into the comparator which is again chosen based on the tag bits. I mean if the tag bit field is of 1 bit, 1 bit comparator is needed. If it's 2, we should opt for 2-bit comparator and so on. For this specific scenario, we require a 2-bit comparator and two 4 to 1 multiplexers working in parallel. Now why is so? Because as 2 bits are specified for the tag field, also each multiplexer can read only a single bit place, therefore 2 multiplexers. As there are 4 lines in the cache, which are addressed by this 2-bit line number field, hence the configuration of the multiplexer is 4 to 1. Now coming to the comparator, it's basically XNOR gate. Because the XNOR gate produces 1 as output when the inputs have same values and produces 0 otherwise. Unlike the comparator that we study in digital electronics, in this, we are only interested whether both the inputs are equal or not. If they are, the output of the comparator is 1, indicating cache hit. If not, the output is 0, which indicates miss. 
So if there are n tag bits and l lines in the cache, n l to 1 multiplexers will be used which will work in parallel. Also, a single n bit comparator will be needed. Therefore, time to find out whether it's a cache hit or miss or in technical terms, the hit latency is time taken by one multiplexer. Now, why one? Why not all n multiplexers? Because they are working simultaneously. Plus, time taken by the n bit comparator. Now, in numerical problems, usually the T marks is neglected as the time taken by the n bit comparator is very large compared to the time taken by the multiplexer. In our later discussions, I will show you that solving another interesting previous year question. Anyway, let's solve this numerical problem at hand for now, shall we? So here, along with the main memory and the cache size, the comparator delay has been given. And we are to find out the hit latency. Now the main memory size is given as 2 gigabytes, which is 2 to the power 31, not 2 to the power 30. Because 1 gigs is 2 to the power 30 and 2 is actually 2 to the power 1, which sums up to 2 to the power 31 in terms of byte. Now the cache size is given as 1 megabytes, that is 2 to the power 20 in terms of byte. Also, we all know that in direct mapping, the ratio between the main memory and the cache size can generate the number of tag bits if log base 2 is applied to it. So there are 11 tag bits because 31 minus 20 is 11. Now the comparator delay is given as 8 n nanoseconds and here the n signifies the number of tag bits. So the hit latency is 8 into 11 that is 88 nanoseconds neglecting the time taken by the multiplexer. So this is how direct memory mapping is implemented at hardware level. For this, we need numerous multiplexers, but only one comparator and the type of it is specified by the number of bits in the tag field. Pertaining to this hardware implementation, this type of questions are generally asked in competitive exams. Now let's talk about the limitations of direct memory mapping. We already know in direct mapping, the physical address is divided as block number and block or line offset. Now, if B bits are assigned for block number, the main memory has 2 to the power B blocks. Also, having L bits for the line number, which sometimes referred to as index number as well, means there are 2 to the power L cache lines inside the cache. Basically, from the B bits, the least significant L bits are nothing but the remainder if block number with value is divided by 2 to the power L. So if X is the block number, then X mod 2 to the power L will produce the corresponding cache line number for the block X. For an instance, suppose we have a cache with four lines and these are the block requests made by the processor in this specific order. So Block request 7 will be placed in 7 mod 4, that is line number 3. Similarly, request 8 will be placed in 8 mod 4, that is line number 0. 6 mod 4 is 2, so 6 will be placed in line number 2. Now 10 will again be placed in line number 2, replacing 6. Then again, 11 will replace 7 in line number 3 and 14 will be placed in 14 mod 4, that is line number 2. Here we can observe that, although the line number 1 was empty, we had to withstand the cache misses due to the strict mapping property. This is called conflict miss. This will be more clear if the block requests are like these. Now for all these requests, the same cache line number 2 will be used even though all the other lines are empty and available. So for direct mapping, conflict miss is the biggest disadvantage. So that was all about direct mapping. I hope we learned something new and interesting. 
In the next session, we will begin the next cache memory mapping technique. So, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.